Good morning. So um, I'm not right. who you're here to see, but I'm who you're going to see. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I am Jack Daniel. Um, I am one of the folks behind the, the B-Sides movement. I've been involved since uh, before the beginning. Um, not that that really matters, but one of the keys to B-Sides is that it is driven by local community and local organizers who make these things happen. That's the power of B-Sides. One of the things I'd like to point out is that uh, um, at B-Sides, we have a founder's circle. But unlike a lot of cons that I won't name, our founder's circle is based on the idea that B-Sides is a growing community. Growing communities need growing foundations. So whether this is your first or 43rd or 44th B-Sides, you're a member of the B-Sides founder's circle because you're participating today. Uh, that's unreasonably real, uh, you know, optimistic and whatever for me, but that's, that's my deal. So, uh, also a strategist at Temple Network Security. I work with Space Rogue and Marcus Ranum. I want you to think about that for a minute. Um, <coughs> makes Space Rogue the optimist, the young optimist in our team. Uh, <laughs> so, um, this is something, I had a conversation with some folks about uh, who we don't know. Um, I actually, I'm an auto mechanic. I haven't quite figured out how I got here. Um, it, it involved like having to stick a tape that looked like a half an eight track into a thing that looked like a dishwasher that was a stack of dishwasher like things so that the parts prices would be right. And then I discovered that when they give you the shoebox full of tapes, um, I found out what an operating system was uh, at 2 in the morning on phone and support when the Dyer Dealer group decades ago didn't work. Uh, anyway, so here I am now. <clears throat> so, disclaimer, I am ignorant. So I am not even a great mechanic anymore because they've gotten uh, damn computers and shit. You can't get away from those things. <clears throat> uh, they don't take security seriously. Um, yeah, cars. But I'm fairly new to the industry in the scale of some people. I mean, like Space Rogue or Jericho, I'm new, you know, I won't say young, but, uh, and, and some of you have been around quite a while. And so I've got a lot to learn. And that's one of the cool things about this industry is that there's a lot to learn. So before you uh, make fun of me, I just would like to remind you, um, <laughs> with the challenges we face, we're all ignorant. It's part of the wonder. Uh, a lot of folks contributed to this, actually, um, uh, Jericho and isn't on here, but he had a couple of names he suggested. Uh, Becky Bates, Marcus Ranum, a couple of uh, non-public lists that I'm on, contributed a lot of names and a lot of ideas. Um, and SPAF had, was instrumental in this. Uh, it gave me a lot of perspective as well as, as names and ideas. I'll right, we'll start out with, uh, I know it's morning, so this kind of hurts. I spread the words out a lot, but it still hurts to wrap here. Why we don't know who and what it is that we don't know. So the early days were different. Uh, there wasn't this, this thing called an industry. Uh, people that worked with computers, some of them were responsible for securing them. That was it. Um, different. It's just what you did. Uh, and therefore, things were different. There weren't a lot of uh, dedicated security cons. It was just different. Uh, one of the things you may have noticed is uh, all the nice folks in the hall, even the ones that aren't saying so, are hiring. <laughs> We're trying to pull people into this industry. We're trying to find the right skill sets. A lot of us come in and try to play catch up, and we can't even keep up, much less have the, uh, the luxury of looking backwards. So, um, you know, it's, we've got to lose some historical perspective. How uh, much of the work was before the internet um, and before the web, and if a uh, you know, if Google doesn't index a paper, does it actually, you know, make a sound? <laughs> uh, yeah, those of us in the industry like to make fun of DOD and academia and government and military, and, and they like to make fun of us and use it <coughs> ridicule as much as they do, but we don't always cross that. Now in this room and in this region, um, there's more crossover because we can't avoid each other. Uh, and there is the, the revolving door from you know military to private to government service to contract and back. Uh, a lot of it is is not one of them. Um, a lot of them aren't with us anymore, either dead or retired or 
even worse, you know, now in management or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> God forbid policy goals. <laughs> And, uh, you know, those that are still around, very few are on the common circuit, uh, at least not our common circuit. You know, some of these folks you do see at RSA, but that's their shtick. So let's start with some folks that you know the names of and, and kind of have a little fun with these. Um, so if you took your CISSB or any other thing, or maybe actually studied this stuff, you know, heard about the Bell Papadula model, and it turns out those are actual people. Uh, they're still alive. David, Elliot Bell, uh, Lynn Papadula is a much more private guy, and you won't find a lot about him. Uh, folks that know uh, David Bell uh, confirmed that he's a bit of a character, has a great sense of humor, but they're like actual real people. And they came up with some foundational ideas that we still sort of pretend to pay attention to, like we pretend the OSI model or you know, the seven layers actually reference anything. But uh, you know, they're real people. And you know, they came up with some really fundamental ideas about uh, you know, no uh, read up and no write down and using access or using matrices. Um, and these folks were at places like Miter, you know, back when it was relevant. No, that's a meme. That's a meme, Jack. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'll make fun of this soon, too. <laughs> There's a Barnes and Noble not far away. They have dictionaries, so some of those words, like continuous, you could look up. But anyway, um, Miter, Honeywell, Teledyne, EDS, CERT, and SA. Um, which brings me to a tangent that I kind of need to go on if I'm going to talk about people from the NSA. Uh, anybody here happy with the state of internet privacy? <clears throat> what, the, what the government is uh, doing? We get, we can get. Uh, like they're up. Yeah, so we've got our FBI director Comey is basically asking for um, asking for you know clipper chip too. He's not using those words because he knows there are a few of us around that know what clipper chip is, and we could say bad things. But no matter what you think of the uh, NSA, through the years a lot of brilliant, dedicated, patriotic, brilliant people have worked at the NSA and have done some amazing work. This is true today. I'm sure in this room, more than most places that I will talk about this, you know folks at that or other agencies. There are some phenomenal people there. Uh, personally, I feel that the failure is at the political level, so that senior management and, at NSA, and then the actual politicians. And I, I won't vent about that, because I know where we're standing, and you have your opinions. Um, it's also important to know that NSA you know, supported a lot of people and a lot of projects. Um, a lot of tech wouldn't happen, a lot of things wouldn't have functioned without the seeds. A lot of people wouldn't have the connections they do that built the industry we're in without NSA. That does not mean I'm happy about the Orwellian or worse state of things. Uh, this also applies to um, GCHQ and similar. Too. Uh, unfortunately, GCHQ in the UK and the other um, entities that are part of Five Eyes are really terrifying because we can Hook up four eyeballs and they still see everything, but that's that's a political issue. So, um, all right, people have heard of Whit Diffie and the ponytail. Um, Whit, Whit rocked it before Bruce did, um, but these are real folks. Uh, Whit and Marty, uh, we use their stuff continuously. Uh, their paper, New Directions in Cryptography, uh, came out in '76. Um, the idea was to distribute cryptographic keys over a non-secure network securely so that we could like do things that kind of is what the internet's built on, if only we could get like SSL right. Uh, <laughs> uh, job security. Uh, so the Diffie Hellman Key Exchange. You know, and in 76 that that like exploded uh, interest in, in asymmetric uh, crypto. And uh, you know it's possible that Ron was uh, more right than the RSA folks because you know Elgin Hall and other things based on this sort of asymmetric stuff seem to have more lifetime. Uh, was it some forever? He is, as a lot of these folks that were early into cryptography, is actually really concerned and has been for decades about individual rights and privacy. Um, Marty's also in, interested in uh, greater social and political things. He is uh, and has been. 
active in the uh, anti-war movement and the anti-nuclear pro proliferation movement. You know, these are actual people. Um, so the crypto folks might know that uh, Marty worked with uh, Ralph Merkel. Here's one of the names that a lot of folks don't know because it's we don't talk about the um, Merkel puzzles and other things, the, the Merkel Hellman uh, knapsack and other things. Uh, his ideas that became part of what we now take for granted as the Hellman Key Exchange uh, started with uh, secure communications over insecure channels. He developed something that they called the, the Merkel puzzles while an undergraduate as a class project. And he's one of the foundational people in uh, one of many people that contributes to a lot of things. He's also, uh, besides inventing public key, you know, one of the early inventors of public key cryptography, he's into uh, molecular nanotechnology and cryonics. These people have other interests. They're actual folks. Uh, you know these people. If not, I'll give you a little subtle hint. <laughs> um, Ron invented a bunch of uh, symmetric key algorithms, RC2456, um, RC being robust cipher or colloquially uh, Ron's code, also authored MD2456. Um, he's interested in privacy and security. He's created something called the three ballot voting system, which does not use cryptography because he feels that democracy is too important to trust to crypto. That think in it, sink in it. Ron? <laughs> Revest says that democracy is too important to trust crypto, and so he's created this thing called the three ballot voting system. And I will basically, you get three ballots. It can be executed on paper. Um, gross oversimplification, everyone's given three ballots. Two of your ballots are designed to cancel each other out. The third one's real. Each one has a serialized number, which is randomized across them. Therefore, if you read the paper, you can see how it's possible to uh, have democracy with verifiable, did my vote get counted, um, you know, things like that. Because he cares about that. Um, Adi Shamir, uh, who's one of the inventors of differential cryptanalysis, Lynn, uh, besides what he does in theoretical computer science and crypto, is into um, DNA computing, using biologics rather than silicon for uh, computing power. These people didn't make a single contribution and then leave and then you know, retire, get a, get a title somewhere, although they did those things too. So who else? Oh, everybody knows these three folks, right? So the crypto folks might have heard of Clifford Cox. Um, I'll refer to him by his first name, even though I don't know him, just because you guys don't need any encouragement to be juvenile, and neither do I. <laughs> We've met. In 1970, <laughs> while at GCHQ, um, James Ellis wrote a paper describing what he called non-secret encryption. These days, we refer to that as public key cryptography. Uh, he wrote that in 70. Uh, Clifford and uh, Malcolm Williamson were college friends, uh, teammates at the uh, Mathematical Olympiad team, you know, won awards and whatever. In 73, both of them joined GCHQ. They weren't quite sure what to do with them at GCHQ, the, the UK version of NSA, if you will, similar organization. So they uh, took Alice's paper, which didn't really implement everything. It just laid out this idea of public space, of being able to do things securely over it. It really kind of defined it, but didn't get the nuts and bolts and working pieces spinning. Clifford took that paper, read it while he was waiting for a real assignment, and um, worked out some of the moving parts, including a critical algorithm. Um, was uh, a few years later created by Ron Rivest and company. Uh, so in 1973, uh, Clifford Cox invented RSA. Uh, 1974, because Williamson uh, had other few things to do, he worked out the, the rest of the puzzle, which was how to securely swap crypto keys over an insecure network. So in 1974, uh, Malcolm Williamson invented the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Uh, two years before Diffie and Hellman's paper came out. But they were spooks. This was not declassified until 1997. Um, uh, Ellis had passed away by then. And 
this is a classic case of why there are some folks that know folks, and especially in a DC audience, there's some of you who know folks and know stuff about those folks that isn't common knowledge, and it's like, there's some brilliant people we don't know. Um, and there are a couple of takeaways on this story. First of all, when you discover, invent, create something, hold your ego in check. You may not be the first. But more importantly, I think, is um, so we, we can all hold our egos in check. Uh, you know, it says the idiot standing in the front of the room. Um, but because of the situation this was used in, they didn't get much value out of it. So a couple of years later, a couple of different teams of people discovered, invented, whatever you want to say, the same stuff and actually built the world we live in today out of it. And so it wasn't new. They thought it was new, it didn't matter. They took it further. They built on what people who came before. So, wow. And, and I'd be willing to bet in, in this crowd, some of you have like found things, whether it's a dis whatever you want. You've found something, figured out a problem, right? Figure out a problem. The first thing you do when you figure out a problem is like, damn, I'm good. And the people that I like to work with are the ones that are like, damn, I'm good, I figured this out. And you know, you go and grab a beer or coffee or a Red Bull or whatever, and you sit back down and think, what an imbecile. Why did it take me this long to figure this out? And that's the kind of mindset that drives us, drives us forward. So anyway. Uh, that's them. 16 people, mostly random order. Some you know, some you've heard of, some you may not have. Um, everybody knows, has to, please, right? Don't, don't raise your hand if you don't, but just, just stop. Tonight, tomorrow, this afternoon, solve this. Um, badass doesn't begin to describe uh, Amazing Grace. If you think compiling all your own shit is cool, um, you can thank her because she got tired of writing everything out to the machine by hand, so she wrote the first compiler. But that was actually really cool because when she started programming, for those of you who saw the keynote this morning, her programming days started when they used patch cables and moving forward to dip switches for programming actually really was an advancement in her career. That's pretty bad. It's uh, she retired from the Navy three times, was brought back three times, retired as a, uh, when they finally pushed her out, uh, rear admiral. Um, just a little bit of trivia, the reason we debug systems is because of Grace Hopper. The mechanical relay that had a moth in it, she pulled the moth out, the computer resumed functioning, and thus we had debugging. Um, at the end, I've got some references at the end of this, if you haven't seen it, uh, there is like a 10 minute clip of her on David Lettering like 20 years ago. It's just awesome. The last 30 seconds are sort of kind of weird. Getting into family, Irish or Scottish family names or something. Uh, it is great to see her because she's just pure awesome. Um, she is, uh, unfortunately, deceased. Uh, but she's kicking. All right, so Spath. A lot of folks know of Spath. Um, Couple of things about Spath. He has a page of firsts. He's done a lot of stuff. We think of him as an academic. So, Tripwire was a summer project for Gene Kim when he was an undergraduate student of his place. <laughs> Folks like Gene Kim and David Farmer and more than I can list are alumni of Spath. He founded the Sirius Institute uh, at Purdue. He's been there since '87. Um, he likes to be known for a lot of inventions and things that he's created. Uh, in this, in the context of this project, his uh, value as a historian has been fantastic. Unfortunately, several of the people that I've researched in this project, the best information I could find about them was the obituary or memorial tribute that <coughs> Spaff wrote about them, uh, which is a great value too. And by the way, uh, Spaff is not just a computer science professor. He's a tenured professor in computer science at Purdue, but for the record, he is also a professor of philosophy, communication, electrical engineering, computer engineering, and political science. Um, and he rocks a bow tie like that. Um, <laughs> Becky Bass, right, so we're here in DC, so everybody knows Becky Bass's name at least, right? Please, please. Pure awesome. Uh, Den Mother of IDS was one of her many nicknames. People that did early network analysis and intrusion detection 
that run companies that some of us may work for now might not have gotten their careers started were it not for Becky's guidance, connection with other people, funding, and other resources from the NSA. Um, and she's done a lot more, but that's where she's known. There are a lot of folks that uh, many of us in this room, like I said, worked with and for, um, got uh, huge career boosts and launches because of Becky. Um, and then she went into you know, private practice consulting afterwards. And one of the most awesome things about Becky is that when she left Southern Alabama, she promised her dad that after she you know, married a damn Yankee and did her government thing up there and did the big business thing, that sometimes she would go home because, as dad pointed out, Southern Alabama could use some help with education. So for the past few years, um, she's teaching at the University of South Alabama, fulfilling a promise um, that she made to her father decades ago, which is, yeah, pure awesome. All right, this guy's on arguably young for this. Um, he's why we have a cert. Uh, <laughs> created the Morris Murder. That's the junior. That's junior, right? Right, this is the younger. Uh, he was the first person convicted under the CFAA, charged in 89, convicted, uh, sentenced to three years uh, probation in 90, uh, I think it was a $10,000 fine, he appealed, they said, no, you're paying it. Um, I don't want to trash any other role models that we might have in the industry of the reformed hacker. Um, but for argument's sake, let's look at the reformed hacker, in air quotes, uh, Mr. Mitnick, his latest venture is selling zero day. Um, this reformed hacker, who never meant anything malicious, by the way, that's pretty much universally understood. Uh, since those days, he is a, he co-founded ViaWeb, co-founded Y Combinator. Um, when you're talking to executives and Congress critters and others, co-founded Y Combinator, I've heard of, that's like a real thing, right? Um, he's a tenured professor in electrical engineering and computer science, has been tenured at MIT since 2006. Uh, if we need a poster child for the reformed hacker, I would um, argue that this might be a better poster child. Uh, which means we've got to talk about his dad. Uh, spent 26 years at Bell Labs back uh, doing things like Multics, you know, or, or, old school hardcore operating system. Uh, later, he moved on to work on this new project called Unix. Um, he spent some years at NSA, specifically 1986 to 1994. So if we do the math from that last slide, that means he was working at NSA and was called into an office to meet with some FBI and other folks <laughs> who had to tell him about, uh, oh, we're picking up your son, he did this. Apparently, uh, uh, Becky has told me, he, she worked with him at the time, uh, apparently the elder Morris was not happy that day. You <laughs> 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 have a couple of quotes that are worth doing. I hate to boil these people down, but I'm trying to cover a bunch of folks. Uh, Never underestimate the attention, risk, money, and time than an opponent will put into reading traffic. Yeah, we have people that still don't believe that, but uh, that's okay. Number one rule of cryptanalysis, check for plain text. <laughs> uh, <it's, laughs> nobody's ever like even tried to solve a con puzzle and worked way too hard, all right? <laughs> um, also, three, his three golden rules to ensure computer security. Do not own a computer. Do not power it on, do not use it. <laughs> Let me remind you, he spent 26 years at Bell Labs working on Multics, then Unix, and then spent uh, almost a decade at NSA, do not use computers. Um, here's one. A lot of people like to be futurists and visionaries and analysts and shit, right? That's cool. Um, theoretically, as a strategist, that's me. I'm not that very good. The computer will touch men everywhere and in every way, almost on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Every man will communicate through a computer whatever he does. Oh, no, it's not. It's a black screen. <laughs> it's for dramatic effects. Let's try that again. <laughs> the computer will touch men everywhere and in every way. 
almost on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Every man will communicate through a computer whatever he does. It will change and reshape his life, modify his career, and force him to accept a life of continuous change. 1966, Willis Ware made this observation. Some of you have undoubtedly heard of the Ware Report. Uh, a lot of you haven't. It is originally released in 67, reissued in 70, 47 year old document. It was designed to talk, about, it was targeted to address the concerns of multi user computing environments handling sensitive, secret, uh, in military, sensitive and secret information in military environments. Uh, it is stunningly relevant today. Uh, it's full of acronyms. It is, you know, 60s, 70s. It is military and government targeted, but it is still stunningly right. You know, he started life in the, in the war, World War II, uh, working on classified radar systems and the you know automatic identification, IFF, friend or foe identification stuff. Um, he spent 40 years at Rand Corporation where he did this. Uh, and so the Wear Report is the big thing that people know. It's still readily available. You can Google for it. But he, like many of these other folks, realized that the power of the computer meant that it would have a great power to be uh, a tool against us and uh, was very concerned with privacy and actually was one of the people who drove President Ford towards uh, the Privacy Act of 74, the first time we had any kind of legislation that was instrumental in getting that. And we actually uh, lost Willis Ware less than a year ago at the age of 93, early yet. Um, Peter Newman, influential to his perspective and career, so I, I would imagine so. He had, uh, had breakfast with Einstein. Um, and you know what they talked about? They talked about the significance of complexity. Having that conversation with Einstein, it sort of altered the way he viewed the world of complexity, and we're still fighting complexity to this day. Um, he was at Bell Labs for a decade, then SRI, and um, still at SRI actually, worked on Multics, and then he actually came worked on something called the PSOS, Provably Secure Operating System. Um, some folks may know he still writes the uh, risks digest. Provably Secure Operating System is, uh, that's, Free global interconnectivity, connectivity of everything, and you know, multi-function computing. But uh, they, people actually tried to make this happen. Patrick Peterson, a lot of folks may know him as an early antivirus guy, but um, quote from Rob Slade on Paget is to some extent the prototypical U.S. good old boy, although he prefers the term Southern gentleman and eccentric. Uh, for the car folks, you know, Paget still drives a GTO Judge. Um, <laughs> uh, dirt track and uh, paved track stock car racer. Um, he is proud of his uh, skill with large caliber handguns, a very good Southern gentleman. Um, Clark's Zenith trans transoceanic radios. Uh, he also was, like a lot of those early AV guys who are going to make the list that I'm doing, is um, they were low level programmers and they wrote low level code because that's how you found this stuff and fought it. William Stallings. Uh, all he's done is write a ton of textbooks which define computer science and other in things throughout everybody taking college courses in this. He did not create algorithms, he did not do, but he sort of is how people in college learn about our industry and related ones, so he's kind of important. And he did it well in that he would turn to um, people who actually knew what they were talking about and were in the fields of antivirus and crypto and other things for his textbooks. Another one everybody should know, she's underappreciated. Um, Dorothy Denning is known for the, uh, again, 76 publication, Lattice Model of Secure Information Flow. Sexy title. Um, the, the data nerds love her, and as well they should. It was basically established a mathematical basis for enforcing security on a computing system. And that's where the data nerds of the world live in that math, and the ones that actually get it, not the ones who just pretend to. Uh, people who actually understand statistics and math, not Larry Bonamon. I said that out loud. Uh, <laughs> uh, but some of us in this community know her because she was an early on sympathetic to early hackers. 
and she got crap for that. And then she changed her view on that as some of them became more and more criminal from just mischievous. Uh, and she also worked on a skipjack cipher, which was uh, used in the infamous Clipper chip. Um, she felt that was necessary, uh, and she defended her position. Um, she still gets crap over that. Uh, she actually still has a Clipper chip device on her desk, uh, at least did a couple of years ago. Uh, she was a professor at Purdue, then to SRI, and then Georgetown. And now both she and her husband are at uh, the Naval Postgrad School uh, as professors. But she's the one that, one of the people responsible for bringing real math into the security realm. Uh, Brian Snow. Brian is uh, an eloquent speaker, another one that spent decades at NSA, cryptographer, mathematician, uh, protected NSA from attack. Uh, his job was securing NSA systems. Um, sees big pictures, really big pictures. So when we talk about crypto and resilience to attack, and it's like, oh, yeah, my credit card number, it'll take, you know, well, credit cards are a bad example. Um, you know, if, if it takes six or seven years to break the crypto on something we're doing, that's not a big deal because it's irrelevant by then. If it takes 58 years to break the crypto on things that's, that are happening at NSA, that could just start the war 58 years later forces you to have a big picture view, and that's one of the things I, I think is fantastic about hearing what Brian Snow has to say. Uh, he was on, uh, we interviewed him on Security Weekly a year and a half ago. He was on Pat Gray's uh, Risky Business Podcast with some regularity. He took some time off after the Snowden things. Uh, just a few months ago, he was back on that. If you want to hear a great interview, uh, Risky Business Podcast, find the one with Brian Snow. He talks about what his beliefs, what his views of NSA are post Snowden revelations, post WikiLeaks. Uh, there's also a, a secondary feed where he talks about the significance of quantum, uh, quantum computing on modern cryptography. Uh, the short versions are screwed. Uh, <laughs> Steve Crocker, uh, inventor of the RFC. First one that was written by him, summary of the IMP software. Not sure that's really relevant. But he's been part of the internet community since the beginning. Uh, when he was a grad student, he actually worked on the original protocols for ARPANET. <clears throat> Steve Lipner didn't want to be in security. He landed at MITRE, um, and they wanted him to do computer security stuff. And he said he would do it only until they could hire the right person. Decades later, or years later, he left at MITRE, went to DEC, he's been at Microsoft for 15 plus years now. He's one of the people that drove trustworthy computing and still does. I'm not sure where he lands in the, the trustworthy computing reshuffle of Windy Block, but he's been driving things since, um, you know, from Multics days to Windows days. And uh, he's one of the folks that's still around. Hal Finning, lifelong privacy advocate. So, hmm? yes. Lifelong privacy advocate, quiet developer of PGP. He wanted to stay out of the limelight. He stayed out of legal battles in the 90s. And when uh, all the legal nonsense flew over and Phil was able to start a company, first person hired was uh, Hal Finn, advocate of anonymous and cryptocurrencies, early contributor to Bitcoin. He's one of the main people that have, the people thought were Satoshi, but isn't. Recently passed away from ALS, um, unfortunately. But he was also a um, advocate of cryonics. So, if he's right, we may hear from Hal again. <laughs> um, Bob Abbott, uh, I can't do him justice, but I'm gonna read seven points from his RISOS Research into Secure Operating System study. 71 to 76, he outlined seven things uh, about securing systems. One, incomplete parameter validation. Uh, at least we got that solved. Two, inconsistent <laughs> parameter validation. Uh, three, implicit sharing of privileged or confidential data. Uh, maybe we're not doing so good. Number four, asynchronous validation or inadequate serialization. That's race conditions and time to use versus time checkout. Yeah, we got those nailed. Uh, inadequate identification, authentication, authorization. Uh, viable prohibitions and limits, and exploitable logic errors. Uh, some of you may know him from, uh, he did a bunch of cool stuff, but we're running out of time here, so I'm not going to do it all, but you, at the end of Sneakers, James Earl Jones is sitting there. That character's name was Bernard Abbott, in tribute to Bob Abbott, technical, um, 
and a little, you know, consultant for this, that, and several members of the, of the cast were based on Abbott uh, team members. Jimmy Anderson um, generally contributed with the invention and explaining the reference monitor and audit-based intrusion detection. Contributed to the Ware Report, Anderson Report afterwards, deeply involved in the Orange Book. By the way, the Orange Book was reissued earlier this year, if you did not know that. There is a new version of the Orange Book. Read into that whatever you want. Uh, let me read staff's obituary tribute to him. Anderson had broad interests, deep concerns, great insight, and rare willingness to operate out of the spotlight. His sense of humor and patience with those earnestly seeking knowledge were greatly admired, as were his candid responses to the clueless and self-important. <laughs> Eschewed public recognition, preferring that his work speak for itself. That's the guy who typed the 90-something page uh, report on information security about if you can still find it on the yeah. internet, but it's, I mean, the, the, Anderson, the Anderson report drove Air Force and most military security for a decade plus. <laughs> and, it, it, yeah, it's still, and it's still a, a substantial reference. Um, so, uh, wrapping up, Babbage Institute, University of Minnesota has a bunch of great oral histories. They have a lot of information on these folks. Uh, Wikipedia, usual disclaimers apply. Uh, Gary McGraw's Silver Bullet podcast, he's interviewed several of these people. Uh, we have on uh, Security Weekly interviewed several, several of these folks. Um, and uh, I, I lean heavily on this dude, not for his physics. Well, I do, you know, well, those of us that like lean on things believe in Newtonian physics. Um, but. <laughs> as a philosopher as well. Um, it's actually not his quote, but he's most famous for it, which is, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that was brought home to me over and over and over again researching this, and as a result, I've started something called the Shoulders of InfoSec Project. There's not a lot there yet. You can contribute. You can contribute a little or a lot. Um, there are about 60 names there now, right, I think, and it's, there's a blog, a single post up, there's a wiki, ugly wiki, it's PD Works. I hate it, it's uh, software Stockholm Syndrome, I hate it, but I know it well, so I use it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, at this time, those people have a link to a page which might have between one and six links on it uh, about those individual people, a bunch of other references and resources, places to find things like, uh, early reports on other projects there. Um, if you would like to nominate folks, please do. Um, I would love it to grow into a lot more. It is a spare time project, so the rate of growth is kind of slow, but there are a lot of folks that we don't know. I would like to eventually be able to have some subsections of folks like early antivirus pioneers, thanks to a coworker. Um, I've got a, a couple dozen of those. Um, but check it out. Everybody that's on uh, this and more are uh, on there. Um, and a variation on this talk was given at DerbyCon, and that's up there, so link to that if you want to share this with folks if you're interested. Um, and with that, thank you very much. <laughs>